Well, as he said, we are going to try to have a round table in an auditorium. So, I've prepared just a few introductory slides so that we can get up to speed with the work that was done at that point too. And I'd really like to end this session with a definite idea of how should we implement the interfaces and other stuff we will need for people to really use scripts that are far more powerful than just the standard ones we have. So the definite goal of these BISLOP filters is to jumpstart the design of the script systems we will need to plug dependency-based and parallel execution in its scripts, which, as some people might know, can reduce the boot-up time to, I don't know, maybe 20% 20, 20 of what we have, so maybe more. So we will talk about abstraction layers, the registry, which doesn't exist yet, and also, I will try to talk a bit about the proposed interface for dynamic dependency in script systems. Uh, this is all work that was done at DebConf2 and survival as a paper at my Debian page at people.debian.org to HMH. So, for this talk, to be successful, we should define our short term, term medium terms, and long term goals. As in, do we really need uh, such a complicated need script systems? How should we start? What should we strive for at uh, for uh, just the beginning? And then, what would be the next step? Should we have a need script registry? That would help us right now with what we have. I mean, a lot, lots of packages start services that really weird positions. Sometimes things break up because a maintainer has no idea who starts where unless he actually searches for that information. And if he does not have all packages installed. Please, go ahead. Um, maybe you could say a quick word about what an init script registry is. I think a registry could be a lot of things when it comes to init okay. scripts. Uh, just a simple table which tells you package foo wants to start a service bar at uh, level bash. So if, if you look at the file RC package, pretty much yes. something like that. Okay, thank you. Should we just support parallel execution one? Well, probably the answer to the first question is yes, we should. A lot of people want that. But when? Should we do that from the beginning? Should we try to plug a dependency-based system without parallel execution first, then try for parallel execution? This is something that I would really like to have a common opinion about. I mean, parallel execution means you have lots of output that you, has to, you have to somehow, somehow organize, otherwise things get really screwed up on screen. Dependencies, should we support them? When? At the beginning, at the second stage. And of course, LSB. Should we actually pay attention to what they say or just ignore them? Should we have a logging layer? My personal opi opinion is that yes, definitely, please, let's have logging. And try to design something then so that we can jump start it and have less claymores on mailing lists before you can start actually deploying stuff. So let's do a quick review on abstraction layers. Well, for the packages to plug into the system without causing all sorts of trouble and actually allowing stuff like file RC or a future dependency based in its script system to work, we have to somehow have an abstraction layer which, which we use on the packaging system scripts to interact with the subsystem. We are al already have a sort of jury rigged abstraction layer that actually works, but it's very limited. There's data RCD, 
which in fact registers an init script. That used to mean just uh, create the, those scene links for sysvi init scripts, but with FireRC it means that adding a line in a table and maybe some other init script would need something else. That is invoke RCD, which runs an init script. Remember, we are talking about the package scripts. We are not talking about the local administrator. The local administrator is supposed to just run the init script directly. However, your package should not. I mean, maybe he doesn't want the script to be, the service to be started when he upgrades the package or something like that. We had that brickage, uh, that brickage for a long, long time to invoke rci.d to fix it. And invoke rcd will probably become a must requirement for Edge through any use, if necessary, to fix the remaining packages that not use, don't use it. And there's another one that uh, I think only the glibc guys actually pay attention to, which is telling it, so that they can start in it when they upgrade glibc. There's not much to do there, as long as we agree to document that only a, s a certain subset of telnit options are to be used. Everybody who writes a new init script system just have to provide a telnit that will work or do whatever is closer to what should be done. Then there are dependencies. Start order dependencies are what we have now. A list of numbers which tell you that at number one we start this, that, and that. At number two we start this, that, and that. Fully static dependencies, which you, is what you have in LSB, that would be, oh, I am need script foo, I need bar and foo bars to run, so please run them before. And then your init script system will read an entire list of init scripts, build the graph of dependencies, and then start running things. After it starts, you have no way to change the dependency tree. And there's the dynamic dependency tree, where it's not known beforehand who depends on what. But when you start a need script, if you need something, it tells you. And if that something is not available yet, you just wait, block it. And when that something becomes available, you unblock it. If that thing fails to start, you tell it that, sorry, you are on trouble, do something about it. So here we have static is file RC and CSV, which we do know. It was run levels. And all information about the order is out of band. I mean, it's on C links or the ATC or file RC file. The static where we have those dependency informations usually in comments. Quite ugly, but it works. It's easy. That would be in band. Or you could have update RCD, you write a file somewhere and have that out of band. Doesn't matter much. As long as we do not screw up and override the local administrator. Yes, please? Yeah, I was curious if we're the first distribution to do this. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Are we the first distribution to look at something like this? Yes. Uh, no? Gen 2. Gen 2, yes. Sorry, I didn't understand. I thought you were asking if someone else had already done that. Yes, Gen 2 does. I don't know exactly what they do, but I think they have a static dependency tree. If they are using something like our unit, it's, uh, it's uh, dynamic. OpenBSD has the static one already for a long time. Um, they, they have an interesting system, and I think that we might want to look closely at their yes. stuff implementing ours. What they do is that every single init script has um, two additional um, arguments, like start, stop, restart. Um, they have um, requires and provides. Yes. And so you call like etc in the Apache to requires, and it outputs something that we could call virtual names, like um, it requires network, it requires um, DNS service, it requires something like that. And then what happens is that when I start Apache 2, it um, checks whether all the required um, features are provided, and if they are not yet provided, it searches the rest of the in its scripts, which one provides them starts those in line, so I it's see. kind of a it's it's kind of a dynamic thing. 
Yes, it's a half a day dynamic system. Yeah. So let's write that down. The problem with that approach is that um, you have some some limitations that are typical of the static ones, and you don't have the higher side advantage of a static dependency tree, which is that you know it fully beforehand. Besides, it's probably easier to understand if a single init script, subsystem script, like uh, RC, does all the parsing, find out who needs to be run when, and does that. The way Gen2 does it, apparently, the, uh, every init script decides if they have everything they need, and if they don't, they start it. Up. The beautiful thing about this approach of Gen2 is that if you have, uh, you are the local administrator and you ask for some service that needs another service, it will really work. So we really should think about that idea. <coughs> oh, what happened here? Apparently, some people don't think we should stay so much time in the same, same slide. Let's skip it. Well, we have already covered it. The idea behind the full dynamic interface is that when you run your need script, you call an exact, exact table that's called need or something like that to say, I need something running, or you call something called provides to say, I am providing this service if I exit with a OK status. And uh, you could also, depending on how much headache you want, have something like before, please start me before something else, which is easy to do the, the Gen2 way, but completely difficult to do the R unit way, way. So you would have to think about it. And there are run levels, which actually are name and sets. Oh, yes. Uh, the name thing is that there are matching provides. I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Um, with the, the need uh, function call, would you be specifying the init script that you needed to have run first, or could you have like virtual uh, names? And yes, then you could. They are called facilities. Right, and would you then call a provide in a different init yeah, script? Yeah, I could imagine it for or more or less like that. Every init script provides a facility name after itself, and it can provide any facility it wants using the provide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's quite a nice, quite a nice way to wake up everybody. Well, so you can really, do you see with me? Yeah. Okay. Well, lost track of the thought. Yeah, sorry. what I was thinking was if you had the need and provide pair, you could uh, conditionally have the script go say, uh, yes. normally I'd want to do this, but that bit isn't working, so I'll provide less. Or normally I'd need this, but that's not available, so I'll uh, need something less. Uh, you, could ha you could do it that way. I mean, uh, it's kind of complicated for the user to understand, but yes, it would support that using something like a test. Please tell me if said facility is available or not, instead of just giving me that facility if you can. This one uh, we should have uh, a long time now, but nobody's really interested in implementing it. 
It's the idea that you can restart something. <laughs> okay. The run levels? Run levels are an image set of services that you have started or stopped. And you can also uh, think about a third set which says that wh whichever is in the set, I don't know anything about. Maybe they're running, maybe they're not. CSV has that idea of incremental run levels, run level one, then run level two which adds some services, then run level three which add yet another service and so on. Debian uses only two run levels, single user and multi user. We also have the let's call them I don't know system run levels of uh, startup and shutdown. We actually have reboot as well, but for Debian I don't know any of anything that runs on shutdown and reboot other than the few scripts that actually do the shutdown or reboot and who cares about that. Others are just act the same. If you are doing a dynamic dependency system, you are really better off if you only have naming sets and um, so that you can roll back to a previous run level or something like that. You really should not have shutdown and reboot separate. It, gives a, it would give you a lot of headache. Maybe you can actually do that, but it's an additional complication that we really don't need. And it's about time someone fixed that. I mean, how many, how, how much is of, how many of you know uh, exactly how that, how the shutdown and, and uh, reboot are, uh, run levels work? Yeah. Is that obvious? No. It first runs all start scripts to do the shutdown. Then it does the, runs the stop script. It's, it's really a key. Then there's try restart, which has the very obvious idea of please restart something that's running, but do not start it if it's not running. Too useful not to trample over the local administrator. I mean, he just stopped the service. Then he changes the run level. Should that thing uh, start or not? Usually we can read his mind. I mean, if it should have been running and it's not, we are to suppose that he stopped it. So we don't start it again. At the init script level, that just means you have to actually implement something that tells you whether some service is running or not. That alone should fix a lot of problems we have if you need scripts that try to go the easy way and do a very poor maintenance job of taking care of data services. Things like calling start stop daemon with that uh, create pid file please function, which doesn't really work. Something that dies leaves uh, pid file behind and it just doesn't. We have to fix the daemons so that they create and take care of the the p files themselves. And that's the first. Oh, yes. Hello. Um, it's on now. It's on. Yes. Uh, I was thinking of a related thing. Uh, to the PID file stuff. When using a system like uh, Runit or Daemon Tools or Minit, uh, we try to keep services running by restarting them if they die. Yes. And uh, I would like for a standard interface something like start stop daemon uh, to be uh, included. Because right now, when I run an init script, uh, I have no reliable way of knowing which process was the related one. Yeah, that's something you lose track of when people start doing the daemon, f the daemon thing properly. I mean, they set a new session ID and you lose, lose track of everything. Problem is that most, uh, most of Debian's work to think the CSV mode. So they start daemons. Probably the easiest way to fix that would be to have uh, two in its script. One that's supposed to work in the background, which is what we have now, 
and one which is supposed to run the foreground, which is what you need to do the R unit way. I mean, you keep you fork a child, and that child should stay there, running on foreground, and you policy it if dies, you restart it. Could be. But is it really worth the fork? Or should we have another action that says run in the foreground? Or maybe an environment variable? That's a question I would like to have as answered here. So please, whoever has a very good idea about that. You can even do a quick vote. Uh, do you think it would be a good enough idea to be worth the fork to implement foreground running services? Please vote yes with your hand up. Please vote no if you're with your hand up. So we have more no than yes. That means a flame more later. We could also use another approach. We could uh, define that uh, the init script itself should policy whatever, where, whatever it started, the service it started, and keep it running. That would be acceptable, I suppose. It's not exactly the CSV way, but stuff like uh, MySQL do, does that already, I think. Yes? Okay, how about if we had the init script um, register with something like the need and provide scripts, the PIDs which it started, and then some part of the init system itself can go back and run stop and start when it dies? Well, the problem you have there is tracking who dies where. Uh, demons fork themselves, and some of them fork themselves on numerous times. You really have to p-trace stuff to know where it ends up, or you have to scan for the exact table name later on the, ba the dash proc table. Anything that writes a PID file should have given you all the information you need, because start stop daemon won't work without it. Not very much works well with start stop daemon. Mm. It's an old idea that we still have, which is useful, but the real idea be be behind the modularization of the CSV in each script systems that you can have anything as a service and that there's a script that you use to interact with that service. We are probably better off if we don't uh, break that assumption. So if we need something like you describe, done automatically by the subsystem, we have to create the proper interface and use them. We should not try to, to second guess what the demons and scripts are doing. That relies on madness, I think. Do you agree? We'll come back to that, that uh, a bit later. Let's talk about the registry then. I've already said that the registry is basically a web page or something, a table, whatever, that tells you that a certain package uses in its script and that it would like it to blah, 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 which the maintainer writes so that you have a basic idea of what it needs, and that the package currently starts it at, run at order foo and stops at order bar so that you can uh, at least try to understand what people are doing. Maybe we want to have so many scripts starting at S20 that way, when they should be at S21 or S19 or something like that. The problem is that that would not be automatically updated, of course. Maybe LinkedIn could check it and complain if it's, uh, it's outdated or something like that, but it's more a tool for developers than anything else. It's not something that the init script subsystem would be using itself. So that you can have an idea where should you be starting your service when you package them. There is another use for it. Should we have dependencies? We have facilities. And then we have virtual facilities, which are sort of like virtual packages. And we have to write that down somewhere, which facility does what. The registry could be used for that. And it would end up as a document for policy or something like that, as we have now for virtual packages. 
Then back to that question. Do you have your answer now? No? Let's go forward. And here we start with the higher things. If we even attempt to try to run things in parallel without doing some sort of input, output, kernel control, we have a complete mess on screen. I don't know how others are doing that, but I think they are doing the complete mess on screen way. At least Open BSD does. So if you try to do that right, you have to somehow capture stand in, stand out, and stand there, which is easy. Just have them directly to pipes and manage that somehow. It's not that easy, but it's not really problem problematic. And of course, we should not try to mess around if we need too much. I mean, it's the single most important problem in the system, not besides kernel. If it breaks, you are really in trouble. So that would be the design requirements. If you have any extra requirements, I'm all ears. No? And there are always the value added features. If we, have, if we implement something like a control kernel, we can actually do that green OK and red fail thingy people seem to like so much. And while at it we could do that graphically, we could have a penguin dancing if things work and a penguin crying if it doesn't, whatever. However, it really gets difficult to parse the neat script output. I mean, we have in policy what people should be using and they don't use that. It just won't work. We have to somehow uh, send control messages so that you really know that uh, need script is trying to start something and that it managed to start that or it's trying to stop and managed to stop or didn't manage to stop or that's doing an extra action such as please while, wait while I uh, set the parameters on SCSI device foo or something like that. And while we are cheat, we might as well add extra output levels as important, normal, and debugging, and shut off debugging so that uh, we have less crap on screen during boot up. And if we need it, we have that, uh, that thing logged somewhere. And I would actually be quite happy if we, implement, if we implemented that alone first in the first stage and then went to dependency-based stuff on the second stage. I mean, that thing is immediately useful. And bootlog just doesn't cut it. It turfs that. It doesn't work always. So there are two main possibilities for a control kernel. In-band. So the init scripts would print something like that. S for I'm starting, or ST for I'm stopping, something like that, a simple tag-based protocol that you have to add before every function. <coughs> or we could have it out of band, where uh, you have a pipe to send those control signals. But then we all know that if you send two messages down two pipes, you don't know which will arrive first, so you have synchronization problems. It's probably much faster to do it in band. Would, any, would anybody be actually opposed to in-band control? Suppose we have set uh, an environment variable to know when the init scripts should add in-band control and add that only when that env environment variable is set so that uh, when an uh, administrator runs the init script directly, it has no tags to make output confusing. Sounds like a good idea. What do you say? Nobody? Yes? Then out of band, anyone would propose we do it out of band? Yeah? Why? Yeah. I mean, it's far more complicated, so you must have a good reason. Um, is that is that on? Yeah, I can't I can't really give you a why at this moment. But I've looked at um, a lot of the in-band stuff, Red Hat LSB, Gen two, and um, I found that in certain points, if you really want to go away from the semi-static um, 
setup that Gentoo, for instance, uses, which I actually think is all right, but I could see that there are um, several issues with it, then what you may want is some sort of scheduler that actually t worries about the um, the order in which the init scripts are started. I'm not talking about well, init. But this control can is only about uh, the input and output control of a single init script. We Sorry? This is a control can only for the input and output to screen interaction with the, the user. We would have another control can of some sort to control the dependencies. Okay, then I'm and that probably will be out of band, all right? Then I am out of band too on this okay. one. Okay, so in band. And of course, how to implement this interface? Well, that is a, that's an easy enough thing to discuss on mailing list, but we could do something like a POSIX shell library and document the, the protocol and make it static enough that people can write their init scripts in Perl or whatever, binary, I don't care. As long as they talk the, pro the proper protocol, it works. And if you are doing it like almost everyone else and using shell scripts, you have easy to use functions, which could, uh, we could actually make them OSB compatible for no extra gain, but so that people are look, think we are nice to the OSB. And the dynamic dependency systems. A dynamic dependency system is the most flexible solution. The only thing it doesn't allow you to do well is to, to say something like that, I want to start before someone else. It's much easier to say that someone else tell, please start me after whoever. If you have a static tree, you know who will start when, so you can do whatever you want. The question? Uh, with the dependencies, I'm working, I'm wondering how you would implement it for something like ISGN uh, startup, which needs to be run before networking but you can't really say networking depends on ISDN. So how would that work? Circular loops we would have to break using human intelligence. There's no way around that, I think. So you, it's a, uh, well, the subsystem has to break loops, but you can't really tell it how it should break loops. So you just break whatever, whoever uh, starts later and ask for something that's already waiting on itself. Then you kill that and say failure and go around so that the administration can fix that later. It would be a bug. For yes, then we would have to find a way to maybe break it in two so that whatever networking that needs to be set up before yes, then can start, starts before, then yes, then, then whatever that needs to go later. We would have more granularity so that we can introduce yes, then in the middle, something like that. There are no real easy ways around circular loops. Well, if, if you had a before implementation, uh, then then it should be fairly easy. You could just say, I see a need to run before yes, uh, but, uh, I, I no did networking setup. If you, only, if you just need a before action, that's easy. What's not easy if you need it in the middle, which you, that was uh, what I thought you were, we were actually asking about. But if you not only need before, that means we have to use a really smart dynamic system or a two-step system where it's dynamic, but you have to, to do a, a first pass where you ask everybody who needs a before to know that beforehand. That could maybe work well. You would have static befores and dynamic afters and provides and everything else. Another thing I was wondering is uh, how do you uh, cover for third-party init scripts? Because we're now setting up a framework which requires script to conform to something. Uh, for instance, I installed VMware uh, this week, which adds an init script to, uh, well, the, the set of init scripts. Um, well, but that may not have the infrastructure. No, it uh, won't have the, inf the infrastructure. The idea is that if they do that through LSB compatible interfaces, we know that it's trying to do that. So. We put that on a different queue, and we find a proper place to run the entire queue in order as if it were the original init script systems, and place that queue some, somewhere into the dependence chain. Okay, thank you. 
And then here is what we have on a dynamic system. The provide, which that facility. Uh, addressing those two points, uh, the first one you might be able to do a bit like the uh, Debian installer menus where uh, the UDEVs know where in the packaging, where in the menu order they would normally fall. And that's the sort of first try at the order that the things get run. And then you enforce dependencies on the packages after that. So if you want something to run before other things, you give yes, it a, that a low be a number. Step in history. But, but then, uh, then you do it actually in the needs requires order after you've done that. Uh, on the things that are just being dropped into RC, it doesn't work to run the whole queue in one place because some things need to be very early or very late. Yeah, so but we might stuff want to that really needs to queues. be very early shouldn't be uh, from a uh, third party. If it is, local administrator would have to, to fix that. Could we not we have some sort We have a, a, a good grasp of where to run stuff, but maybe we could even have more queues. Maybe one queue for low numbered stuff, another for middle numbered stuff, and another for high numbered stuff that runs last. Could we not have a, a system where um, a default in its script would uh, need uh, S20? Yes. And then you could s uh, have various points in the dynamic system that provides S20 and S5. Yeah, that's, and S a, that's about uh, the idea of a uh, middle, middle position at Q, I think. The okay. DEP, dependency. Well, there's provides, with which if we run them at the very beginning of a uh, script, might, uh, might fix the idea of the befores. Um, what I would like to see in that system is for an administrator, he might want to change dependencies. For example, usually the Apache web server doesn't need remote file systems, but he might if the files are on the remote file system. So it should be possible for the administrator to add or change dependencies and without having the um, debconf ask him an upgrade, do you all want to override the file? Well. So there should be a place for out of band additional dependent information here for the local yes, administrator. Yes, you, you would need uh, static dependencies for that, and you would also need uh, an out of band storage of the dependency information. If you want dynamic dependencies, forget it, it won't work. It will have to be a mixed system at best. And the inbound won't work or, or with that. I mean, unless we actually go there and somehow get it out of band and then run it in band inside the script system, which sort of defeats its purpose. Can you have chances, chance, uh, just have a file, etc, uh, init dependencies, where you add Apache double point uh, uh, colon <laughs> remote file systems, and the init script ch checks the dynamic dependencies of Apache, but also looks in that file for local changes or additions? Well, then we have, would have a mixed system, but that would work, I suppose. Thank you. that provides before, after, and test. Those are quite uh, obvious. All them, but before, which really requires previous knowledge of the dependency tree, or you have something weird that always fails if, for, if by any chance you hit a before that can't be, be acknowledged, I suppose. How important is a before? That's one question we, question we should answer. Is it that much important? Um, there's a similar arrangement that with um, the package control information. We have provides and enhances. And um, at the moment, we've been doing very, very well with just provides. So um, enhances, the idea there is that you can actually like extend large packages in terms of functionality without actually having to change these large packages. So it's, it's modularity. Um, I don't think that actually, um, if we have a proper policy, if we say that the, um, if we have a topo um, topology for the available facilities, like we say there's a network facility, there's a time server facility, a web server facility, and so on, then we won't need it. If we actually need, um, no, I actually, don't, I actually don't think we need it because uh, the things that you will depend on are things like network and web server stuff and they would have to say, I am the web server, I need to be started before this version control system XYZ which you're going to run over web interface and it's just not going to. Yeah, 
Yeah, and so for cool. stuff like ESDN, we could have uh, another prior networking setup facility that it can depend on and it's run by network. Network depends on prior network or something like that. That would give us easy before without uh, the trouble of actually walking downwards on the dependence tree. Well, I have only five minutes left, so. I just want, I just want to add for that problem, we might have a um, after, if, there. So um, network will be started after ISDN if there is ISDN, but will not fail if there's no ISDN at all. Well, we can do that with using tests, I think. This test for, yeah, okay. Yeah, for it's test. dynamic, I mean, you run it, and depending on what it returns, you can call a provide or an after. Okay. Oh, yes, how to track in the scripts ID. I have figured that uh, by myself, after I wrote these slides, environment. You set an environment variable with the ID, then run the init script. Uh, everything that uh, needs to send you data back, tags that ID first, and then you know who is trying to tell you what over the control kernels. I don't think there's a much better way than uh, this one. Anyone has any ideas? Isn't it is working here? Uh, isn't the before basically just the same as uh, if the uh, second, if the other script actually depended on the first one? So it's basically kind of like reverse dependence. Yes. So you could handle it like that. It's nice, but it's very hard to implement. So the question was, can we do without it? Can we do it? But without it with no, uh, no such functionality. We, had, we have been doing that with package dependence for a long time, as he said. Mm. You can emulate it when you really want it. Yeah. And, well, that's all for the slides. But, let's hear the ideas and jump start. Um, one problem is things like uh, network disk mounts. Some things w need your disks mounted first and, and want the disks mounted to, to do stuff to start the network, and other yes. things want the network started so you can mount disks. So, you know, basically it's a circular dependency problem that more or less needs to be broken manually, but yes. how, it, how it needs to be broken may well, depend on your local system. Yes, so we, uh, we are back to the local administration must be able to change the dependence tree locally somehow, and that we may need to have a facility broken up into uh, stage one, stage two, stage three, or something like that, probably before, during, and after, so that we keep things simple. Yep. Yeah, first of all, I would say that I would I really like your effort to improve the init system in Debian. It's been in need of a well, complete rewrite and improvement for a couple of years now. I hope you can provide uh, statistics on how you can speed up the process. I did already does that. If you have a look at their pages, they have uh, statistics of what, how much you can get out of the parallel execution. Well, I've seen it, but uh, well, Gentoo seem to produce interesting graphs for a lot of things. I'm not sure we can trust them. Well, uh, we can always have it optional and not enable it by default if it won't give m a much, much of a boost. I don't well, know. That's, that's not my main point. My main point is that uh, we need to uh, make sure the system is uh, highly dynamic and yes. configurable because like, you can have a server which is using, uh, it's, it's the LDAP server, and you're using LDAP to log in. Yes. So we need to start LDAP server before any of the other services that will need users. And then you might have a different server which is using the LDAP, the other LDAP server to provide user information so it doesn't need to start the LDAP server, yes. which is like the enterprise something else LDAP server. So you have two different settings with the same packages installed and they are depending on each other. Uh, depending on the content of the LDAP server. So you need to have two different dependencies for these two servers. Yes. And uh, for um, 
uh, RAID and LVM, for example. If you have the root system on RAID LVM, you need to start root on LVM first. Yes. And if you However, don't, you probably you can start on later. Uh, yes, but you probably do that on an uh, init IRD anyway, or the kernel will do that for you on the RAID well, system. Maybe. Probably. Or maybe USR but is the, on RAID. The question so about the LDAP server score uh, actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And we've had that problem with. Uh, with cool Linux where we are using LDAP and uh, yes. I also hard detection. Yes, I don't know if we can automate that. I mean, uh, local, local overrides for administrators are fine, but as, uh, as soon as we start implementing local overrides for packages to override other packages, we'd be better off using before or something like that, really. Hmm, maybe, I don't know. We'll have to find out. So we are back to, do we really need before? Maybe yes. For that kind of thing you are suggesting? Probably. I don't think there's another way. We can actually implement before using a dyna dynamic tree, but it all ends up to, uh, to somehow knowing beforehand if something will need another before. And so you end up with two steps, and it may fail depending on what you, are, you have installed. If something decides to provide and something else dynamically, you can't know that because it's a, conditional pro it's a conditional thing. So if someone does a before dependency on that, it will save a, a so, sorry, you cannot do that. We don't know about it. Nothing is going to provide that. So you either you start it right now or if you fail. That would actually work, I suppose. So we have before useful for. Could I say highly unlikely or at least uncommon setups or not? Are those setups so common that we really should have default? Should have a. a something tied to the packaging system that allows us to do that so, so sort of, we really need the service before the others. I mean, in the case of uh, SCO Linux, you could just uh, add uh, some changes to the dependence trees. That's the idea behind, behind a, a custom daemon distribution, I suppose. Yeah, prefer is a, actually. It ends up that if we can do that, we should try. If we cannot, we will have to do it without. I think we will have to take that the main list because my time is over. Um, sorry, we are running out of time. Um, interesting session. I hope you can continue after that, a um, little bit more private, uh, which means not in this room. Um, we are starting, uh, next session will be in five minutes. Volatile Archive for Debian by Andreas Bart and Martin Zubelhellas in this room when they wake up soon. <laughs> or in the small auditorium, the Debian Free Software Guidelines by Matthew Garrett. Um. Thank you. And thank you very much for your participating in this bit of feeder section. <laughs>